Hey everyone, this is Aaron Gallagher from the Authentic Christian Podcast. Uh, this video sort of supplements uh, Season 4, Episode 3 on the uh, resurrection. And uh, during that episode, we get to what happened after the resurrection. And we're discussing John 21, 15 through 17. And I kind of wanted to do a follow-up video to that because we filmed that episode about two months ago. And since then, I had some uh, interactions with some friends of mine. We've started sort of, me and him started digging a little bit deeper. Uh, and then I did some more personal study on my own. And I think I may have changed my position on John 21, 15 through 17. Nothing really large, but maybe more like the significance of it. So I wanted to do a supplemental video for that. So if you've watched episode three of season four, we talk about the timeline of the events uh, after Jesus' resurrection, right? How everything happened and who he appeared to and what order, etc., and how to synchronize the gospel accounts. Now in John 21, 15 through 17, Jesus and Peter have this exchange together that I've sort of studied over the years and went from this position to this position, and now I'm back to the position I was originally. And so the passage, uh, or the point that gets discussed many times frequently over this section of scripture is the meaning of the Greek words for love that are used here. Um, the passage here, those three verses, use and sort of have this exchange uh, between the words agape and phileo. So if you, if you do much study or you've heard someone teach you about the four Greek words for love, it's normally described like this. At least this is how it was explained to me. You have the word eros, which is a Greek word that is not found in the New Testament, I don't believe. I'm not sure if it's found in the Septuagint, which is the, the LXX, just like we have a Greek New Testament that's translated into us, English-speaking people, so we can read it in English. Uh, before the time of Christ, 200 years, 250, um, there were people who spoke Greek that wanted to know what the Hebrew Old Testament said but didn't speak Hebrew. So they needed their own translation. So a group of men took the Hebrew Old Testament, translated it into Greek. That's what people refer to as the LXX, which means 70, or the Septuagint. Okay, So if I say the LXX, I say the Septuagint, that's what I'm talking about. So I'm not sure if the word eros, which is where we get our word erotic for physical or sexual love, I'm not sure if that's in the Septuagint uh, or not. Uh, it's not in the New Testament, the Greek New Testament. Uh, you have a second word for love, storge, all right, which uh, is familial love, okay? Uh, and then you have the word phileo, which is normally described as brotherly love or human love, the love of friends. And then agape, which is divine love, unconditional love, or the love uh, of, of choice. It's a decision you make, and it's the kind of love that God has, right? That's the way at least I've heard it uh, explained, so I can't speak for everybody. But when you go back to John 21, 15 through 17, the first time I read this, I simply saw this as Peter has denied Jesus three times before his crucifixion. This is just Jesus giving Peter three times, uh, three more opportunities to confess his love for Jesus to sort of make up for those three denials. And so it was a very re re uh, re redeeming, restoring scene for Peter, where Jesus is basically giving him this opportunity to redeem himself, right? Uh, and then Jesus is going to tell Peter, the result of you being faithful now is going to be you're going to die for your faith just like Jesus being a faithful shepherd would lead him to his death. Peter, if you're a faithful shepherd, you're going to die for your faith as well. Right Now, years later, I was discussing this passage with somebody, and they pointed out to me that there's an exchange in Greek that you don't get in English. And so they showed me how, hey, and this is really what I introduced in the podcast, is that you have Jesus asking Peter, do you love me three times, right? In English, do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes, right? In Greek, this person showed me that Jesus asked Peter, do you agape love me? Do you the highest form of love? At least that's what I thought at the time. Do you the highest form of love love me, Peter? And Peter says, Lord, I phileo love you, a lower form of love, the brotherly love. Jesus asked Peter again, do you agape the highest form of love for me, Peter? Do you have it? And Peter says, I phileo love you, a lower form of love. And the third time, Jesus concedes and says, Peter, do you phileo love me? And Peter's grieved because of this. And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I brotherly phileo, not the highest form agape, but I brotherly love you. And so Peter was grieved because Jesus sort of condescended to his level of love. And so it was pointed out to me at that time that agape was the highest and phileo was the lower form. Therefore, Jesus was basically asking Peter for a confession of the highest form of love, and Peter said, I, I can't say that since I betrayed you. And so it's Peter and Jesus with this exchange that Peter does say, I love you, Lord, but it's, it's sort of disappointing for Peter uh, if you look at it that angle. And that's really the, the angle that I looked at it for quite some time. Um, 
Is there more to this exchange though? Is that the right way to look at it? Uh, I wanted to do this video because since we recorded the podcast episode, I think I've changed my, my line of thinking on this. And I would say a few things. Number one, does what you know about Jesus throughout the rest of the Gospels lead you to believe that Jesus would settle with Peter for less than the highest form of love? I mean, doesn't Jesus normally challenge us, call us to progress higher in our love for ourselves, for others, for God, not digress, right? So would Jesus accept that from Peter, right? Well, uh, after we filmed, but before this episode released, I was discussing it with a friend, hey Jeff, and um, he wasn't so sure about whether that was the right look at uh, John 21, 15 through 17. Uh, he said, I don't really know if that's what the exchange is going on there. Maybe they just are sort of synonyms. And so we talked about it quite a bit, looked up some articles while we were riding in his truck. And then after that, I've done quite a bit more research uh, on it on my own. He, he and I, our discussion sort of got me thinking. And so since we recorded the episode a month or two ago, uh, I've studied it more, and I want to give you more information of what I believe actually is the, the more accurate uh, position. And so basically, I think what really boils down to in this section John 21, 15 through 17, is there a difference between agape and phileo? Um, is agape the highest form of love and phileo a lesser form of love that is reserved for humans and not for God? Or are they used interchangeably? Um, is one just maybe more common than another? Um, and so here are the three main positions that I found in my research. The first one is the one that uh, I explained in the podcast and that I just sort of explained a minute ago. And that is that agape is a higher form of godly love. And Peter is just unwilling to commit to that strong of a term with Jesus because of his um, betrayal. And so Jesus concedes and comes down to Peter's uh, level. So that's the one I already kind of explained. Um, but this position assumes agape is a higher form of love than phileo, which a lot of people believe. And I get that. I, I believe that for a long time. But uh, at least I want to introduce some more information. Option two is that Peter is actually using phileo as a more powerful word than love. Um, some would say, well, this makes the exchange more powerful because Jesus is asking Peter, do you agape love me? Peter says, Lord, I don't just agape love you. I love you phileo. I love you more than agape. I love you not the common Greek word for love, agape, which is used 50 sometimes in John, and agape is used less, like maybe 10, 12, 15 times. So I don't just agape love you, Lord. I love you like my own flesh and blood. That would make sense for Peter to saying, no, Jesus, I don't just agape love you. I higher form. That fits with Peter's character. That would not be Jesus condescending, uh, if that's the right word, down to a lesser form of love. Right Now, while it would make that particular section more powerful, um, I want to show you what I think is at least, I feel like I'm fairly, fairly certain that position three is correct. Position two might be um, correct. I don't think phileo is a higher form of love, but I think that they're used interchangeably. And I think that phileo is a less common uh, form of the term. For instance, I tell my wife I love her all the time. But every once in a while, I'll say, you know what? I want to say the same thing, but I want to use a, a word that maybe is not as common that shows herself, I cherish you, I adore you, right? I'm saying the same thing. One doesn't mean that I'm more in love with you than the other. I love you or I cherish you, I adore you. It's the same thing. It's just a less common way of saying it, all right? And so I think that part, the, the second position could be partly correct. But I want to look at the third uh, position. And so first, I want to look at position number three. And position number three is the idea that they're used interchangeably. Okay, So I want to look and say this. I believe that this third position makes sense because I think, first of all, look at the context. Uh, if you look at John 21, 15 through 17, the Holy Spirit uses three other pairs of different Greek words interchangeably in this passage. Uh, if you look at the word feed, for my sheep and take care of my sheep. That's Bosco and Poimeno, two different Greek words that are used interchangeably. Uh, nobody's making big exegetical arguments based off the different words, right? Um, the, the words for lambs and sheep, arnia and probata, uh, no one is making big arguments off the difference in those words, but they're used interchangeably, lambs and sheep. He doesn't mean two different types, uh, two different groups, right? And then you have the words for knowledge, oida and gnosko. They're both rendered you know in verse 17. They're both rendered as knowledge. Um, and no one's making these big arguments. In fact, in uh, one gospel um, commentary, D.A. Carson said, these, the different pairs of words that we just explained, have not stirred in his words homiletical, preaching, imaginations. It's difficult to see why the first pair should. So what he's saying is, hey, in this section of scripture, there are four different pairs. So eight words, four pairs of words that are two different Greek words that are being used interchangeably. 
but we make a big deal out of phileo and agape, why we don't make a big deal out of the other three pairs, the words for feed and take care of, lambs and sheep, and the two words for knowledge, all right? And so he says, why are we making a big deal out of this one, this one pair when we don't say anything about the other three pairs, okay? Secondly, second point why I think you can see they're used interchangeably is notice that when Jesus asks Peter, do you agape love me? Peter does not say, no, Lord, I phileo love you. How does he respond? He says, yes, Lord, I love you, right? In John 21, uh, 21, 17, uh, let's go to verse 15. John 21, 15. So when he had, they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, feed my lambs. Verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Like the point I'm making, Peter doesn't say, no, Lord, I phileo love. He says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, right? So Peter is responding, yes. He's not responding, no, Lord. I don't agape love you, I phileo you. He says, yes, Lord, I agape love you, I phileo you, which is either interchangeably or he may be thinking it's a higher form of love. You're my flesh and blood. I love you more than just this common Greek word for love. And then in verse 17, it says Peter is grieved. Why is Peter grieved? I don't think he's grieved because Jesus went from agape to phileo. I think it's grieve. he's grieved because Jesus asked him a third time, which would what? Bring to your mind, if you're Peter, what? Your three betrayals of Jesus just a few days earlier. Okay, that's the second point. The third point, why I think that they're used interchangeably. It's normally said, as I mentioned earlier, agape is the highest form of pure love in the New Testament. It's the godly type of love in the New Testament or in the LXX, which is, I think I explained this earlier, the Greek translation from the Hebrew Old Testament. People in the first century BC, second century BC that wanted to read the Hebrew Old Testament but didn't know Hebrew, they needed a translation, just like we need a translation into English if we can't read Greek. So, agape love is not always depicted as the highest form of pure love uh, in the New Testament or the LXX, the Septuagint. Look at John 3.19. John 3.19 says this, This is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light. That's not perfect godly love, and it says the people loved agapao, they agape loved the darkness. So that's not a love of a good thing, it's a human love of darkness. John 12.43 says that agape love was the kind of love the Pharisees had for the praise of men, okay? In fact, if we're talking about the interchangeability of these words, Matthew 23, 6 and Luke eleven forty three. Matthew 23, 6, Luke eleven forty three. they both talk about how the Pharisees loved the best place, places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, and they use both words interchangeably. Matthew 26, 23, 6 says they love the best places, they phileo the best places. Luke eleven forty three. 43, Woe to you Pharisees, you love the best seats, you agape the best seats. So the Pharisees love the most important seats at these banquets and synagogues, what? Matthew's account uses phileo and Luke's account uses agape. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 10, it says this, Demas, Paul says, Demas is said to have forsaken Paul, forsaken, this present, uh, forsaken him because he loved agapao, this present world. That's not a godly form of love. He loved the present world. That's why he forsook Paul. And the last one I'll give is 2 Peter 2.15 says that Balaam loved, agape loved, agapao, the wages of unrighteousness. So you can see that the word agape is not always used of just godly love. It's used of Balaam's love for unrighteous wages, of Demas's love for the things of the world. Uh, it's used for the Pharisees' love of the most important seats in the synagogue, uh, Luke 11.43. It's used of the Pharisees' love for the praise of men, John 12, 43, and John 3, 19, recapping, the people loved darkness. Now, that's in the New Testament. Uh, in the Septuagint, the LXX, uh, the translators that translated it 100, 200 years before Jesus, they used the words that to them, knowing the Greek language, uh, represented love. In 2 Samuel 13, verses 1 and verse 15, there's a story about Amnon uh, who rapes his half-sister Tamar. That's not a love, a godly form of love that anyone wants to emulate. Uh, it's about one person raping his half-sister. And in 2 Samuel 13, 1 and 15, it uses the word agape, the translators did of the Septuagint, which means those translators at the time before Jesus, they thought, hey, this word agape is not a godly form of love. It is a common form of love, and that's why they used it to translate what we would say is an ungodly type of love. Um, there's other New Testament passages like Matthew 5, 46, 
Luke 6.32 and Luke 11.43. Um, that would confirm this point. And then there's other um, Septuagint passages that uh, where they used agape, and it's not really this perfect godlike type of love. Psalm 4.2, Psalm 52.3 and 4, Proverbs 1.22, Proverbs 8.36, Hosea 3.1, Hosea 4.18, Jeremiah 5.31, and I think Jeremiah 14. 10, okay? So uh, when you look at the New Testament and the Greek at the time the New Testament was translated in the Septuagint, it uh, doesn't seem like agape was this higher form of love. All right. Fourthly, I think this is maybe one of the most important thing, uh, important points to show they're used interchangeably, is to see that phileo and agape have been used interchangeably by the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John and in the rest of the New Testament, and then we'll even look at the Septuagint again. So earlier in the Gospel of John, right, the same setting is the upper room, Thursday night, our time, before the night that Jesus is arrested, right? He's in the upper room there, partaking the Lord's Supper. They're washing the feet of the disciples. Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples. Uh, they're partaking of the Passover uh, meal. That's what's the setting, right? But look at these two passages. Compare in your Bibles John 14, 23 and John 16, 27. John 14, 23 says this, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. Okay? We will come to him and make our home with him. So John 14, 23, Jesus says, If you love me and you keep my word, my Father will love you. If you love Jesus, Jesus' Father will love you. Okay? In both of those accounts, it uses the word agapao, which is the verb form of agape love. Okay? So Jesus said, If anyone loves me, if anyone agape loves me, my Father will agape love him. Right? But look at John 16, 27, two chapters and four verses later. It says, For the Father himself loves you, why? Because you've loved me, Jesus, and believe that I came forth from God. So John 14, 23, if you love me, God will love you. John 14, 23, if you agape me, John 14, 23, my father will agape you. But in John 16, 27, it says the same thing backwards, but it's two different Greek words. Jesus said, why does the father phileo love you? Because you phileo loved me. So Jesus, if you agape love me, the father will agape love you. Since you phileo love me, the father phileo loves you. So Jesus used these terms interchangeably himself in the Gospel of John. And it's not just Jesus speaking in the Gospel of John, uh, it's also uh, throughout the Bible. Uh, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 9, you have the Apostle John, okay, but he's through inspiration writing. And in agape, uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 9, he uses the word agape, right? He says, you know that I have loved you, agape. But 10 verses later, in Revelation 3, 19, Jesus is loving the church and he says what? to the church of Laodicea, as many as I love phileo, I rebuke and chasten. So God phileo loves man, God agape loves man. They seem to be used uh, interchangeably. And then once again, if you go back to what did the word mean in Greek culture at the time, you can look at the Septuagint and see how these Greek people translated the Hebrew uh, into Greek. And if you look at Genesis 37 and verse 3, now, Israel loved Joseph. Israel's not the nation here. It's Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So it's talking about the father of Joseph. So Jacob, Israel, Joseph's dad, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them. Okay. Now, in 37.3, Genesis 37.3, Israel or Jacob, his father, loved Joseph more is the word agape. He loved him agape more. Verse 4 when his brothers saw that his father loved him more, not agape again, but phileo, they're used interchangeably. In fact, in Proverbs 8, 17, you see it interchangeably used in the same verse. Those who love me, I love. Those who phileo me, I love agapao. So you take Proverbs 8, 17, you can put that right next to John 14, 23, John 16, 27, and see that not only did the Holy Spirit and the inspired first century writers use it interchangeably, but also the people who knew the Greek language at the time, of course the Holy Spirit knew, but I'm saying people who weren't inspired, who used the Greek language at the time, the translators, uh, they also used them interchangeably. And you might even be surprised, as I definitely was, to learn that uh, in many places where you'd think agape would be used, if agape was a higher form of love, uh, you see phileo used. John 5, 20, the father phileo loves the son. So God the father, Phileo loves the son. Now, John 3.35 says God the Father agape loves the son. But if you put John 3.35 and John 5.20 together next to each other, the father loves the son. But one uses agape, 3.35. One uses phileo, John 5.20. In fact, in John 11, they're talking about Lazarus. And John 11.3 and 11.36, they both say that Jesus phileo loved Lazarus. 
Uh, did Jesus not have agape love? Well, yeah, he did. He Agape loved Lazarus, but he also phileo loved him because they're used interchangeably. This may be one of the coolest ones for me, and that is that John was called the disciple whom Jesus what? The disciple whom Jesus loved, okay? I found five times, unless I missed one, he's called the disciple whom Jesus loved five times in the New Testament, okay? Now, four of those, he's called the disciple whom Jesus agaped, agapao. Uh, John 13, 23, John 19, 26, John 21, 7, and John 21, 20, the disciple whom Jesus loved agape love. But what about the fifth time? That's only four of the fifth time. The fifth time is in John chapter 20 and verse 2, where it says, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and it's phileo there. So John is called the disciple whom Jesus loved. John is the inspired writer. But in one time, he calls him the disciple whom Jesus phileoed, and four times the disciple whom Jesus agape. So my conclusion right now is that based on the evidence in the New Testament and what the Holy Spirit inspired, agape and phileo are used interchangeably. So what's my conclusion? Well, I believe the third position is correct. These words are used interchangeably in the Gospel of John. Now, I will say that words have semantic ranges, which means a range of meaning based on the context. So as some scholars think phileo uh, may have a higher calling, I don't know if the word means anything higher, but I do think, like some of the New American Standard translators have said, that agape was the common word. If you look in John, I think I said this earlier, maybe I didn't, was used 50 some times, I believe, and phileo is used less, like, I don't know, 10 to 20 times maybe. And so while phileo may have been interchangeable with agape, it may just be a less commonly used word. Um, for instance, I tell my wife I love her a lot, but I say I cherish, I adore you less, not because it means anything less, it's just sometimes I just say I love you and then later I think, you know what, I wanna say the same thing but in a unique way. And so I say, I cherish and adore you. So maybe it's the same thing, but a commonly expressed way. So that would kind of mean that maybe both two and three are correct. That maybe Peter is in his own way trying to say something, Jesus, I don't just agape love you. Let me use a, I cherish you. I adore you. I phileo love you. Or maybe they're just used interchangeably uh, as they are throughout the gospel of John, as they are used in Revelation 3, 9 and 3, 19, and many other ways they're used interchangeably. Uh, in uh, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And so that would mean that just like my very initial understanding that was sort of skewed by a little knowledge of Greek, <laughs> more studying has showed that my initial plain reading of English it, it seems to be the correct, which, the correct position, which is that this is a truly redeeming scene for Peter. That's the impact of John 21, 15 through 17. And that is that even though Peter had said, Jesus, I will lay my life down for you, John 13, 37. And P Peter says, Jesus, even if everyone else abandons you, I won't do it. If everyone else leaves you, I won't, uh, I won't leave you. Uh, Matthew 26, 33 and Mark 14, 29. So even if everyone else leaves you, Lord, I won't. I will lay down my life for you, John 13, 37. In the next verse, John 13, 38, Jesus says, Peter, you're going to die me three times. And so later that evening, Jesus is arrested and Peter did just like Jesus uh, knew what happened. Peter abandoned Jesus in the garden. Now John 18.18 18 tells us that there's a charcoal fire and uh, Peter is asked about his relationship with Jesus. And next to this charcoal fire, remember that, charcoal fire, Jesus denies, or Peter denies Jesus three times. And Luke 22.61 says, as soon as Peter said it the third time, Jesus turned and looked at him. And so Peter is next to this charcoal fire and he's just denied Jesus three times. And it says he goes out and Jesus looks at him and makes eye contact, and he goes out and weeps bitterly. And as far as we know, Peter doesn't see Jesus for another few days. You have the events of the betrayal, the arrest in the garden, the trial before Caiaphas, the trial before, uh, the trial before Annas, and then to Caiaphas, illegally through the night, this kangaroo court, until they send him to be scourged and then crucified the next morning. He's buried uh, on uh, Friday. He's in the tomb Saturday. Peter is likely hiding for fear of the Jews as they were after the resurrection. And then on Sunday morning, Jesus resurrects. And the women go to the tomb and they come and tell Peter. And Peter runs to the tomb twice, doesn't see Jesus. He wants probably nothing more than to apologize for betraying him three days earlier. Until finally, Jesus sees Peter. He appears to him in the room. They finally make their way to Galilee. They're out fishing. They haven't caught anything. And they see this man on the shore. And he says, cast your net on the other side. And they throw the net in. 
and it's full of fish. And John looks at Peter and says, it's the Lord. And Peter dives into the water while the other guys seem to, to try to get the fish in. And Peter, then you see, is on the beach eating uh, fish with the Lord. And notice John 21, 9. They're sitting next to another what? Another charcoal fire. And so I believe that's maybe the only two times that a charcoal fire is mentioned in the New Testament. And the first one is Peter's denial of Jesus. And I wonder if that's why Jesus has this charcoal fire, is to, to remind Peter, hey, I'm going to give you another opportunity next to a different charcoal fire to make a different decision. And so Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter responds, yes, yes, yes. And so Jesus gives Peter the chance to redeem himself for all the three betrayals. And then Jesus tells him about his future and what following him faithfully would lead to. And, you know, sometimes in Bible study you sort of come full circle. And, you know, years later now I'm back at the same simple position that I had the first time reading the passage in English. And that is that Jesus gave Peter the opportunity to redeem himself and make up for his past mistakes. And I think that's the key takeaway from John 21, 15 through 17. And just sort of application for us, Jesus is making that same opportunity to every single one of you who is watching. Um, have you made mistakes in your past? I bet the answer is yes. I sure have in my life. Um, have you denied Jesus in words or the way you've lived or in something you've done? Absolutely, I'm sure you have, just like I have. And if you have, Romans 3.23 says you have, just like I have, you know, you can make it right. And Jesus is ready and willing to give you a chance to redeem yourself, just like he did uh, with Peter. And the way a Christian does that is to believe in Jesus, John 8.24, Repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess Christ, Romans 10, 9, and 10. Uh, and to finally be baptized, be immersed in water, because that's what God said to do. And when you do that, physically, you're immersed and buried in water, Romans 6, 3, and 4. Spiritually, your sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus, which is what cleanses all sins, Revelation 1, 5. And that happens when you obey the command to be baptized. Paul had believed, repented, confessed, and in Acts 22, 16, Ananias comes to him and says, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And what are you doing when you're baptized? You're washing away your sins and you're calling on the name of the Lord. You're asking God to save you in faith. Colossians 2, 11, 12. 1 Peter 3, 21 says, Baptism now saves you, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, not washing dirt off your body, but your appeal to God for a good conscience. You're asking God to cleanse you from your sins through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is where that blood was shed. Hopefully this helps uh, give some more information on John 21, 15 through 17. I always reserve the right to be wrong and change a position later. And uh, I think this one is a good one to change. So if you need any questions, you need anything, you have any prayer requests, whatever it is, you can reach out to us at The Authentic Christian. And our email is AuthenticChristianPodcast at gmail.com. AuthenticChristianPodcast at gmail.com. Or you can reach out to us here at the Gospel Broadcasting Network by emailing us at info at GBNTV. Thanks for watching. Hope you all have a great day. And we'll see you back on the next episode of the podcast. See you.